that phrase in the chant just now, those who don't discern suffering. It sounds strange. We all detect suffering in our lives. And that's a daily occurrence. Sometimes there's a lot, sometimes there's a little. Some people, of course, deny that there's suffering in their lives. I remember a newspaper reporter in Bangkok one time asked me, why is it the Buddhists talk about suffering so much? I don't suffer in my life, he said. I says, well, do you have any stress in your life? Oh, yeah, stress, lots of stress all the time. Well, that's it. That's the same sort of thing. And the big issue is not so much the stress that comes from outside, it's the stress that we add, that comes from within. And this is the stress to which we're often most blind. We just think that's just part of the way things are, or we attribute it to things outside. And so when the Buddha said discerning suffering, what he meant was really understanding what it is, where it comes from, what can be done about it. And in particular, this, the added suffering that comes that's totally unnecessary, and yet, which is really the suffering that weighs the mind down. Because without all that added stress, the mind would not suffer. There would be pain in the body, but there'd be no pain in the mind, no sense of being burdened by the pain in the body. And so it's not a question of detecting suffering, it's a question of understanding it, comprehending it. And this is re requires that we be willing to sit with it for a while. And to sit with it, the mind needs strength, and that's why we develop concentration and mindfulness. Actually, there are five strengths that the Buddha talks about. The first is conviction, the conviction that we're going to get past the suffering. We have to understand it, i.e., it's our own duty. It's something we have to do on our own. We can get help from other people and explain things to us. In fact, without that help, we'd often be totally lost. But still, we're the ones who have to do the actual work. And having conviction in that, that our decisions, that our choices really do make a difference. That's a strength right there. And then you stick with it. Keep watching what it is that you're adding to the situation. And if you notice that you're adding anything that's unskillful, you try to figure it out. Exactly where is this unnecessary? Why do I believe it's necessary? What would the world be like if I didn't do this? What would my life be like if I didn't do this? I mean, you'll notice, as we talked about this earlier in the morning, but when you're sitting and tensing up around the pain, you find this. Say you have a pain in your knee, a pain in your back, a pain in your hips. And you tend to tense up around it, and part of you believes that you have to do this to protect yourself from the pain spreading to different parts of the body. Yet the question is, does it really keep things under control? A lot of these attitudes, reactions that we have around pain come from way back from the time when we didn't understand anything or we didn't understand language. We had pain, we had to deal with it. The baby coming out of the womb dealing with pain, has no way of comprehending it, but will try out different ways of fending it off. And if something seems to work, that suddenly becomes a habit. And some of these habits go way back to that time, even before we understood language. This is why when you ask questions about physical pain, sometimes it's good to ask questions that sound very strange. Which side of the pain are you on? Exactly which pattern of tension is keeping the pain within limits? What would happen if you let go of that tension? And oftentimes you find that you've added an awful lot of extra stuff that was really not necessary at all. So you want to keep this up. 
but in order to have the resilience to keep coming back to this, it requires mindfulness and concentration. The mindfulness is keeping something in mind. Here it's keeping the fact that you want to understand the pain and the it's not so much just the physical pain, of course, it's the pain in the mind, the tension, the stress, the constant pressure that you're putting on yourself one way or another. And here again, you run into that question of, well, if I didn't put pressure on myself, this wouldn't get done, that wouldn't get done. Well, maybe it would still get done, but without the pressure. This is an important point to keep in mind. And also you want to sort out exactly where is this particular stress in the mind coming from. Is it coming from the body? Is it coming from feelings? Is it coming from mind states? You want to learn how to notice these things on their own level. This is why the frames of reference are that, just the body in and of itself, feelings in and of themselves, mind states, mental qualities in and of themselves. Because we tend not to see them in and of themselves. We tend to see them in terms of a larger story. If there's a feeling, it's a feeling about something. If there's a mind state, it's directed at something. We don't really look at the feeling or the mind state in and of itself. And so we start with looking at the breath in and of itself. And you'd be amazed how many stories you can build up even around that. Although you have trouble sitting down with the breath, one of the immediate stories is, well, this I'm no good at this, I can't do this, something's wrong with me, or the meditation doesn't work, or whatever. Those are the first set of hurdles you have to get past. And then you get past, you find you run into more and more subtle hurdles, the different stories the mind throws up about the past, the future, whatever. You've got to keep reminding yourself, well, just get out of that framework. It's like finding yourself in a really bad dream, and suddenly there's a, something inside you that remembers, hey, wait a minute, this is a dream, I'm asleep, and you can wake up and you're out of it. And so a lot of the attitudes we have around our suffering are that. They're bad dreams that we've got involved in, and we need to wake up. And it's good to keep this in mind. This staying with the body in and of itself is a good way of recognizing the dreams as they come. And you recognize that, you begin to see there are things that you add to the experience in the present moment that are totally unnecessary and not all that useful. Last night we talked about how unreal our thoughts can be. I mean, they seem to have a huge reality. but. There's no way that a thought can really correspond to the reality out there. This idea that truth is an issue of correspondence. It's like a friend I had in high school. He said when he was a little kid, he'd get a map and he'd take a magnifying glass and look at the map to see if he could see the little houses and the trees and everything that really existed there. Of course, he was disappointed. There were no houses and trees. There were just the, the lines of the roads along the, this white background. And could you say the map is inaccurate? Well, I mean, if it's an accurate map, it's there for the purpose of when you want to drive. But there are lots of other maps that you could draw of the same place. It's like that atlas we have of Saskatchewan that they printed for the, the millennium. They have a map of everything. But there are lots of different maps, and the maps are all very different. There's the maps of where this bird is located and where that bird is located and when, where this mineral is found and what lies underground. And each map is accurate, but it's only a partial picture. It's accurate for a particular purpose. When you want to find about the birds, you don't want to necessarily know about population locations, human population locations. or patterns. So you look for the particular map that you want, and you say, okay, this map is good for that purpose. And this is another thing you've got to keep in mind, is the ideas that come to your mind around a particular topic, what purpose do they serve? And if they seem simply to serve the only purpose of giving rise to more stress, okay, those are the ones you want to get rid of and just let go. 
to whatever their truth value, they're not useful right now. The Buddha once said that he would speak only things that were true, beneficial, and timely. And the same principle should apply to your thoughts. If you find a thought coming up in the mind, the first question is, is it true? Well, even if it's true, it's not necessarily what you need to think about right now. It's like the map. you've got the wrong map, maybe. It's perfectly accurate for describing where the northern warbler is located, but that's not what you need. If you're looking for a uranium, you want another map. So the question is, is it beneficial? And this is, is this the right thought for right now? This helps to clear away a lot of the extra things that we habitually add to our experience right now and get in the way of understanding exactly what is this process, where are we adding unnecessary suffering. The strength that really enables us to do all this is the strength of concentration, the ability to give the mind a place where it can rest. And if you've been thinking about things too much and analyzing things too much, you say, okay, for the time being, I'm just going to sit here and be very, very still. And whatever comes up, you treat it simply as an issue of, does this contribute to your stillness or does it get in the way? Let go of the, let go of the things that get in the way and hold on to things that contribute. There may be some issues that need to be figured out, but if the mind needs to rest right now, you say, okay, I've got to just let that pass for the time being. Note that there's an issue that still is unresolved, and then you just let it go. Figure out what you're able to handle right now and what has to wait for later. And whatever parts of the mind say, this is stupid, just being very still here, you don't listen to them. They're getting in the way. The one that says, I'm bored, the question was, who am I? Why do you immediately identify with the I in that thought rather than the I in the I want to stay with a breath? You have lots of different eyes, and you can really choose them. So for the time being, if the mind needs to rest, if it needs to gather its strength in that way, whatever else comes up, whatever gets in the way of that, you have to realize this is totally superfluous. I don't need this. And just let it go. Whether this requires looking at the drawbacks of that thought, or ignoring it, or simply relaxing around it, or whatever. You do whatever is needed to keep the mind still. But discernment itself is also a form of strength, in the sense that if you see through a problem, you don't have to just put in the force of will to stay still in the face of something. That's difficult. John Fuang had a student one time, a, a woman had a really bad problem with cancer. She had cancer in this part of the body, they'd take that out, and then the cancer would have spread to something else, they'd take that out. And there was one time that she was undergoing radiation treatments for cancer, and they discovered that she was allergic to the anesthetic. And she said, well, I want to try it without the anesthetic. And they said, well, it's pretty, it's pretty painful. And she says, well, I'm a meditator. Let me give it a try. And so they, they did. And when she came out of the treatment, she said she was totally exhausted, just trying to fight off the tendency of the mind to go to the pain, to identify with the pain. She was fighting, fighting, fighting all the way, just trying to use her powers of stillness not to move in the face of it. And John Fung went to visit her after the treatment and asked her how it went. She told him what had happened. And he said, well, it's a lot more efficient if you can use your discernment, realize, okay, the awareness is one thing, the pain is something else, and just hold that understanding in mind. And she said that from that point on, it was a lot easier to go through the treatments. It didn't take so much force of will. This is how discernment is a strength that sees through a problem in a way that requires less energy on your part. So this is what it means to discern suffering, to 
to see which part of the suffering comes from unnecessary activities that you're engaging in. And all you have to do is stop. Of course, it's not as simple as just all you have to do, but that's the basic solution. It's learning how to see exactly what you're doing and where it's unnecessary. That's what makes it simple. It's Once you've reached that point, it's simple, but it's seeing that it's unnecessary. That takes a lot of understanding, a lot of patience, and a lot of trying to figure things out. Because so many of the things that go on in our lives are things that we totally take for granted. It's got to be this way. It's got to be that way. When this happens, I have to do this. When that happens, this has to go along with it. And we just assume that's the way it is, without really looking into it. And what the meditation does is gives you the strength and the opportunity to really look into what are you doing to add unnecessary stress to your life. To recognize that, yes, you're doing it, and two, it's unnecessary. Once those two things are fully understood, it takes a huge burden off the mind. <laughs>